one, I discussed the fact that the inhabitants of Bethlehem, when Christ was just a little child, that they had no discernment. In this part two, I'll elaborate more on that. And I also want to point something else, point out something else. The wise men or the kings from the east that arrived in Jerusalem, they were not smart either. Look, see it like this. I'm going to give us a short parable here. You have a couple. The husband is narcissistic. He has a short fuse. And he never tolerates people um, telling him anything. It's his way or the highway. One day, you're at the mall. And you see his wife over there. And she's with another man. Kissing, touching, very, very close. What do you do? Are you going to say hi? Are you going to break the whole, uh, hold them apart? I would recommend you to notice it and to keep on walking. Why? Because when that narcissistic man of hers finds out that she's cheating, remember he's a narcissist. He doesn't want to endure any distress nor any frustration. He wants a target. And if he's a coward, he will take it out on anyone around him. So don't be the messenger that will, that will receive the violence. So in this case, even if you are inexperienced at life, you would realize, okay, this is a bad situation. I need to stay out of this. I don't want to be involved. Now look. Yet those kings from the east that arrived, they arrived in Jerusalem because the Roman roads were constructed towards capitals and big cities, so they arrived in Jerusalem and they openly talked about wh why they were there. I mean, okay, let's reflect on this situation, all right? You have foreign kings so they were had they were leaders leading countries outside of their own jurisdiction so when they were there it would it would be a diplomatic visit okay so yeah so let's see them as diplomats even though they were the leaders themselves they arrived in jerusalem they don't travel alone they have their servants with them to assist them so we have this group of people that arrive in Jerusalem and they're wealthy. So of course it's going to catch people's eye. Of course they're going to get attention. So Herod, the king of Judea, who was a vessel of the emperor, that Caesar, found out. And when he found out why they were there, because according to prophecy, the king of the Jews was born, both Herod as well as the people in Jerusalem, they were frightened of what they heard. Now look at the situation, okay? You had the Roman Empire, and in what do they call the Middle East, you had uh, some military bases of Rome, well, actually you had uh, quite a lot of them, and you had Roman governors, and in Judea you had a king. Because uh, the, the people from Judah, they had their own royal house, the Hasmonean royal house, I believe it was called, and the Hasmoneans, they were legitimate Judeans who governed Judea during the Greek Empire. When the Greek Empire turned into the Roman Empire, at some point Rome installed Herod as a king, and Herod later intermarried with one of the Hasmonean princesses, just to gain legitimacy and recognition by the people. He never got it. Rome depended on Herod being accepted by the people. Now, the people never accepted Herod. They just tolerated him. And to make things easier, Herod invested a lot in infrastructure and in entertainment. So Herod made sure there was economic activity so that there was prosperity to ease the people. Nevertheless, it was a very sensitive political situation.
you had an illegitimate king that was not accepted by the people, and you had the Roman Empire, who was fixated on using violence to maintain their territory, who needed Herod to be a le- uh, to become a legit king. So there was a political tense situation, and in Judea at the time were many revolutionary types that challenged the Roman Empire from time to time. Nobody wanted to have a civil war. Everyone just wanted to live and get along. They didn't want Rome, but they tolerated Rome and Herod as long as they at least could have their lives. So in this political situation, which is quite tense, you have foreign kings arriving with their servants, with tribute, they want to visit the king of the Jews. By saying they want to visit the king of the Jews, they're actually stating that they don't recognize Herod as king of Judea. And by doing that, they're also saying that we don't recognize uh, the Roman emperor as the head of the Roman Empire. So they acknowledge the legitimacy of Christ. And by doing that, they triggered fear in the illegitimate administration. I want you believer to learn the following over here. Every place you enter has its expectations. Someone told me once, every house has its rules and every house has its problems. I say say it like this, every place has its expectations that people establish over there. Those expectations don't have to be correct, they don't have to be right, some of them are plainly wrong, but those expectations are there. When you arrive at the place, first of all, you should send peace ahead of you. I taught you that before. So that when you arrive, you arrive in power, so that you can overrule all negative expectations over there, because Christ is the Lord of the earth. So that overrules all claims of human beings. But besides doing that, pay attention to the expectations that are around. In Rome, there was the expectation that the Judean people would get along with the Roman economy or the Greek economy, because the Roman Empire was just a Greek Empire renewed. In Jerusalem, you had the wealthy Judeans, the religious leaders, as well as the illegitimate household of Herod that all wanted the people to get along with each other so that there would be ease and prosperity in the area. And yet the commoners who tolerated both Rome and Herod as long as they could have their daily lives. So, so that was the situation. That's how people related to one another. Those foreign kings arrived with their servants, with cargo, and they came in and they made plain, we want to visit the king of the Jews. So by saying that, they were saying, okay, um, this is how Herod, as well as the administrators of Rome that were in Jerusalem, and as well as many of the common people who heard about this, how they perceived it. Okay, we know that Caesar lives in Rome, all in Italy. That's about two weeks across the sea. We know that Herod is the vessel of Rome over here, but according to prophecy, the king of the Jews, or the king of the Judeans, better said, well, is born right now, so we want to visit him. We, we recognize him, the, the real one. And their, atti- their attitude was right, but their actions were not practical. You can have the right attitude, but you can have an uh, unwise approach. There's a difference between an attitude and an approach. Your attitude is how you relate to something or someone. Your approach is how you deal, in fact, with that someone or something you have an attitude towards. You always have an attitude towards others. But how do you approach them? Their approach was not wise. They could have better said we come here because we have business interests. They could have at, at least masked why they were really there. Or they could have used another tactic to find out where the Christ would be born without actually mentioning it way too obvious. Why? If they would have done that, then uh, Herod, as well as the ministers in Jerusalem, wouldn't have felt threatened by it. 
it was only violence and blackmail that kept um, Roman authority over there through Herod. Herod knew that and Herod knew very well if he would fail to keep the people in check, Rome would come after him and his family. So for Herod, it was very important for them to be recognized. So those men arrive, not considering the situation, they, they approach the situation in a very unwise way. So when in Jerusalem people heard, and also Herod, because the people heard it first, then Herod heard it. When they heard about the Christ being born, they were frightened. They would think, okay, if the Christ is born and he's the legitimate heir of the Judeans, and he's also the savior, that means that when he's older, he will, he will demand his throne. And if people around here adhere to him, he will have a big following and he will challenge the Roman Empire and he will, and this is going to be a big fight. Now, Herod was already old back then, but Herod at least knew that the fact that there's a little child, probably a little baby or somewhere below two years old, who is a legitimate heir to the throne, that news already is troubling. Because that means that there is a legitimate challenge to this illegitimate administration. And the fact that there is a legitimate challenge means that people can now join the, the legitimate challenge and that already can cause a lot of trouble for us even though the legitimate challenge it isn't even of age yet to actually take the throne. So, the situation was frightening. Also for the commoners who didn't want another conflict. So, Herod called the wise men together the stakeholders, and they figured out, okay, this child has to be born in Bethlehem. So, the wise men were told, when you find the child, tell me where he is, so that I can come and bring tribute to him. So, the wise men left, they arrived in Bethlehem with their cargo, and the people of Bethlehem uh, received, uh, rece received them. It all happened like that. Joseph received all the tribute on behalf of little baby, little Jesus. So probably Jesus wasn't really a baby anymore, but okay, that happened. But it was already a big conflict about their arrival. And here's the thing. You have the king of the Jews being born, and the king of Judea is saying, I want to bring homage to him. Hold on a minute, but isn't Herod a vessel of Caesar? For him to bring tribute to another king would be to betray Caesar. So the kings from the east that arrived should realize, okay, hold on a minute. How come this man who's a vessel of Caesar say he wants to come and bring homage to another king? This can't be true. This doesn't add up. This is too good to be true. Those, wi those wise men from the east should have realized, okay, this is too good to be true that King Herod wants to bring homage to the child. We need to watch out with this. Now, anyway, they were in Bethlehem. The people in Bethlehem, they saw those men arriving with their cargo on their horses or camels, whatever they used. They saw that Joseph, this carpenter, received a lot of tribute on behalf of his son. And the people were talking about it, all of that. But hold on a minute, how come we have kings arriving in Bethlehem and Herod isn't there? None of the Roman representatives are there. That also should have been a red flag to the people from Bethlehem. And then suddenly they left. The wise men left. They were warned supernaturally to leave in another way. And Joseph was also warned to leave. So the people of Bethlehem just realized, okay, yet diplomatic visit here for Joseph, who doesn't even hold a political office, that's already weird. And now, after he received all that wealth, so there was a wealth transfer that happened over here, so Joseph became rich. After that happened, now suddenly the men leave and Joseph leaves. Okay, this is weird. And how come those kings didn't invite Joseph to, Beth, to Jerusalem 
to discuss things with him there because Jerusalem is the capital of this kingdom, this part of the Roman Empire. How come they came to Bethlehem and they didn't invite uh, Joseph to Jerusalem? So there were so many things about the situation that didn't add up. There were so many red flags and realized, okay, this situation may trigger violence. And it did. When Herod found out that the wise men left without telling him, without informing him, he went and took vengeance on the people of Bethlehem by killing their boys below two years of age. Because think about it. Those foreign kings, they were in Bethlehem for a while. Remember, during that time, you had no buses, no trains, no airplanes, none of that. So traveling was slow. Also, communication was slow. So they were in Bethlehem for a while. So Herod thought, okay, if those people are in Bethlehem for a while, and then they leave suddenly, then the people of Bethlehem must know about it. Because it happened in their town. And the people of Bethlehem didn't think so far. What the people of Bethlehem should have done is as follows. When they noticed those men entering in, the heads of the families of the town should have come and said, oh, hold on a minute. What, why are you here? Oh, you want to visit someone? Okay, but who are you? You're a king? You're a wise man, you're a king from some foreign country? Okay, but this is just Bethlehem. This is not the capital. Why are you here? Um, look, whoever you need to see, please send a messenger to invite him and meet with him in Jerusalem. Because, look, we live under an autocratic tyranny called the Roman Empire. Caesar uh, is charging us with taxes. And you have this demon-possessed king over here, which none of us want, but we tolerate him, called Herod, and he's out of his mind. And he's known to kill people when he's out of his mind. We don't want to become a target. We have nothing against you want to visit someone, but please do it outside. If the people of Bethlehem would have responded in such a way, they would have done well. And God would not have been upset with it because, A, they're being practical. They look after the safety of themselves and their children. But the people of Bethlehem were not interested in what was going on in a sense that they were not alert enough to realize what was actually happening and they allowed it to happen and later it worked against them. Don't you know that there are many people like that out there? They're not interested in what's going on around them. They, they have their routine and the only things on their mind is their routine. Common people are like that most of the time. There are even beliefs like that. Well, that attitude will cost you in the long run. Let me give another example. Let's say that there's a fugitive, someone that's wanted, and the police are looking for him, even the FBI and the CIA are looking for him. One day, the CIA finds out that he is at a barber shop. So, they observe him and they, and they see that he's visiting the barber shop very often. So after about three months, the FBI, together with the local police, they raid that barbershop. And during the raid, they fire shots, and there were even children there, and some of the children died. Now, the police should have dealt with the situation in a more practical way. They should have found, should have managed to to isolate him and then to arrest him. But hold on, he was a fugitive. And as a fugitive, they were after him. So the people that welcomed him in their community, they should, have, they should have investigated where he's from and why he's suddenly there. Because them associating with the fugitive meant that they were now on the radar too. And when the rest team came with a SWAT team queen, when a SWAT team came, they were a target also. And here's the thing, this, the, the police could justify their actions by saying, hold on a minute, people, this man is a fugitive. It has been all over the news that people are looking for him. And he's here with you and you also notice it? Come on, that's suspicious. 
let me give another example. Let's say you have someone from the criminal world who robbed other criminals. He stole their cocaine. He stole cocaine, sold it for a high price, and got rich with it. So now you have criminals with hitmen after him. If that individual that's haunted by criminals, if he's seen with you often, the criminals will observe that he's with you often, so when they can't find him, they will come to you. And they may put a gun to your face and force to come with them so that you can tell them where their target is. So it's not wise to associate yourself in order to be involved with someone that's a target. Now, we know that when it comes to Bethlehem back then, the people of Bethlehem lacked discernment. The people in Jerusalem, ooh, they were aware, think, okay, these men arrived saying they want to visit the king of the Jews, this going wrong. They knew it would go wrong. The people in Bethlehem lacked discernment. They were thinking, ah, oh, we're just a small town over here, not much important happens over here, so, oh, you have those men come, come here with, all, with gold, with uh, incense, all of that. They want to visit uh, a king that was born. Oh, a king that's born. Oh, fine. They should have realized, okay, this may trigger anger, violence. We need to do it differently. Why did I decide to make a two-part series about the massacre of the innocents in, in, innocents in Bethlehem? Because I want you to be alert. The, those wise men or those foreign kings that arrived in Jerusalem, they were not smart in their approach. They had the right attitudes by saying they acknowledged Christ, but they didn't have the right approach. Sometimes ha having the right, right approach is more important than having the right attitude. Sometimes your approach will mask the fact that you had the wrong attitude. And there are even narcissists who understand this. There are narcissists out there who just want to exploit. That's their attitude. So they are wrong, absolutely. But they approach you in a pleasant way. And because they approach in a pleasant way, you are fooled by their pleasant approach and you fall prey to their exploitation. So those narcissists, they use the right approach because they know that the right approach will get you somewhere. Too often it happens that believers have the wrong approach. And having the wrong approach can cost you unnecessary trouble. Yes, we will go through persecution and tribulation anyway because we follow Christ. Christ told us that. However, there are some afflictions and some fights we can avoid by having the right approach. Now, the right approach does not mean that we submit nor agree, submit to nor agree with negative expectations of the world. No. If there are negative expectations in the world, we should not agree with it, no neither should we submit to it. What we should do is we acknowledge those expectations are there and we tolerate the people that hold on to those expectations as long as the tolerance doesn't lead to uh, danger and we get along with the people in a practical way while not forfeiting our mission in Christ. That's how our approach ought to be, flexible and practical. For example, if you are in a community where they are worshiping um, nature gods, you don't come there and say, you guys all worshiping demons, Christ is Lord, you're all coming to burn, blah, blah, blah. You don't do that. Why not? Because the people there don't know any better. That's all they have. And if you attack all they have, of course you're going to get a, 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 a very upsetting response. No, you just enter in, you walk by faith, and then you realize, hold on a minute, this man is walking in power, or this woman is walking in power. And then you're going to ask, okay, where does your power come from? And then you can mention Christ, and then you realize, hold on a minute, it, those idols we're worshiping, those statues come to ending for us, Christ's Lord. That's what I mean, having the right approach. But look at this. The people of Bethlehem neither had the right attitude nor the right approach. And that's how tragedy happened to them that could have been prevented or that could have been um, bypassed. So believers, 
Do not be like those people of Bethlehem who lack discernment. Be alert, have both the right attitudes and the right approach. If you lack discernment concerning the right approach, go into prayer, and if needed, cons um, ask for counsel from other more experienced believers. Well, that's it for now. Keep agreeing with Christ and be at peace.